This is uh, Jim Fetzer, guest hosting for Gary King on the new JFK show, number 210, where we're very, very pleased to have as our special guest, David W. Manick, the leading expert on the medical evidence in the assassination of JFK the world has ever known. We also have Larry Rivera, and he and I are delighted to have David here to discuss these matters where we're beginning with David's review uh, of a book by one Robert A. Wagner, not the actor, on the assassination of JFK, Perspectives Half a Century Later. David, what drew you to this book? Well, we were at the mock trial in Houston last November, and this book cover was constantly displayed on the screen, and uh, the author introduced himself to me. We had never met before. And I, I had no idea what his position was. I had not read his book before the mock trial, so I had to read it afterwards. And I was so horrified by the zillions of mistakes that he made that I felt that I, I had no choice but to respond to it. Well, at one point, I think you compare him to Vince Bugliosi, and I think that's a very apt comparison because this is really just a reaffirmation of the Warren Commission report the claim that Oswald fired three shots from the sixth floor killing JFK. And as you explained very, very patiently, my friend, he ignores all the evidence to the contrary. Yes, he's very, very much a clone of Vince Bugliosi. They, they ignore a lot of evidence, but of course, because Wagner's book is so much smaller, he necessarily avoids even a lot more evidence than Bugliosi did. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that Bugliosi, with his um, many pound weight book, still missed a lot of things. He, he focused on items that were not very important. And, and R Wagner's at a huge disadvantage compared to Bugliosi because his book is so much thinner. Well, it's thinner in more senses than one, David, because, you know, you make mincemeat of it. Here's one of the passages. Where he claims there is simply no reasonable evidence of Dealey Plaza assassins other than Oswald. David, I mean, what an absurdity. The guy has to be a complete and total ignoramus to make such a claim. Yeah, he has uh, many crevices in his understanding of the assassination. Uh, it, it's amazing that he claims to have looked at this issue of the assassination over many years, but yet at the end of this um, um, review that I did, I list 80 individuals or items that he does not cover in this book. And as you go through them one by one, you, your mouth will open wider and wider thinking, how could he possibly miss that one? Well, so your, your, your uh, audience can and just page down to addendum A and see that 80 item list. Yes, yes, yes. But here's some blatant evidence that's been around forever, David. I mean, here's the McClellan diagram. Does he think that is the result of a shot fired by Lee Harvey Oswald? He does. <laughs> and how, do, how does he want to make that claim? I mean, here's Charles Crenshaw's description of the same wound, David. This is obviously a wound of exit. So unless Lee Oswald was in front of the limousine, how could he possibly have fired the shot that caused this cavity? Well, that's not a very big problem for Wagner. He accepts this quite quickly as uh, the work of Oswald. Or actually, to be a little more honest about this, he claims that these, uh, these sketches are incorrect. They couldn't possibly represent reality. So of course, the that's... physicians who were there at the time at Parkland Hospital who actually observed the wound up close and personal, but in Wagner's opinion, they couldn't possibly bear any correspondence to reality. No, all the physicians at Parkland made a mistake, even though this was part of their everyday job. And how about your discernment of the metallic particles from a second shot to the head? What does he have to say about that? He doesn't address that issue either, nor did Bugliosi. The point I made about these, of course, is that they are, they are uh, mostly toward the front of the skull. Uh, the largest one is at the rear of the skull. And we know that the largest one would travel farthest because it has the greatest momentum. And so that is totally inconsistent with a shot from the rear. But that's what Wagner wants us all to believe. 
Here's some more evidence that's been around forever. All of those witnesses who described the blowout at the back of the head, according to Wagner, then all of these witnesses are wrong? Yeah, they're all mistaken. David, but I mean, right, we already reached a point of absurdity here. This man obviously isn't respectful of logic or evidence. No, no, he, he, he has come to a conclusion and everything has to support his conclusion. And here's all the witnesses from Parkland talking about the cerebellar as well as cerebral tissue extruding from the wound. Does he understand the significance of that finding or is he completely oblivious to the structure of the brain? He, he should be uh, quite clear about what this all means. We have two neurosurgeons who said they saw a cerebellum plus many other doctors who surely after going through medical school anatomy classes would know the difference between cerebral tissue and cerebellar tissue. But this uh, does not make any impact on Robert Wagner. What about Wagner? Does he, has he even gone back to listen to the reports that were coming nationwide on radio and television, where on NBC News, for example, including Chet Huntley there on the left, they were reporting the shot to the throat, a wound of entry? based upon uh, Malcolm Perry's Parkland press conference, and later it, about it having been a simple matter of a bullet right through the head that entered the right temple, blew out the back of his head, attributed to Admiral George Berkeley. David, that was right on national television. Well, it's obviously wrong, according to Robert Wagner. They just well, made a mistake. This is just embarrassingly bad. So that we it, it is. It is. It is embarrassing. So we actually have, you know, uh, uh, we'll come back to this question, but if you take into account the shot to the throat and to the right temple attri attributed to the wounds incurred by JFK at the time on national television with then the shot to the back of the head from, uh, from Bethesda and the shot to the back, which of course we know would be moved upward by the Warren Commission, you have a minimum of four different hits to JFK. And it appears, David, he's oblivious to all of this. He either ignores it or makes very light of it. He, he, he does know a good deal about the case, but where it runs against him, he, he disparages it and uh, does not want to include it in the analysis. This, this is just a blatant example of special pleading or the method of selection and elimination. Select the evidence that supports a predetermined conclusion and eliminate the rest. Cherry picking. Yeah, and his whole book is fraught with these logical mistakes, as I keep pointing out in this review. And here, of course, he's claiming the three pathologists, he's talking about Humes and Fink and Boswell, were unaware of a gunshot wound in Kennedy's throat. But we know, David, that's completely ridiculous. Well, we, we know that they were aware that there was a, a wound to the throat that, because they discussed the possibility of a fragment exiting through the throat. We have that from a good witness there. And we also know from the Secret Warren Commission uh, meeting that occurred in January that the, the, staff, the staff members there, the Warren Commission members also uh, read the autopsy report and right in their autopsy report they were reading there was a discussion of the throat wound. This is a report written by the pathologists. So of course they knew about the throat wound. Boswell I even admitted that later. And of course you mentioned Bob Livingston who, who called Humes initially to talk about what he had heard on national television of a small clean puncture wound to the throat, obviously a wound of entry, and he called Humes to explain to him how the throat had to be very carefully dissected because, and I find this so ironic in retrospect, if there were any evidence of shots from behind, then there had to be at least two shooters and therefore a conspiracy. And Livingston, of course, testified to this under oath during the lawsuit that Charles Crenshaw brought against the Journal of the American um, Medical Association for misrepresenting what he had said in and his activities there in Trauma Room 1. And here's Chuck's own diagrams, which he did for me at my request. David, I was astonished when I asked Chuck to do these diagrams that uh, the previous investigations hadn't asked the physicians to diagram what they did. 
I mean, this wouldn't be until Douglas Horn did his uh, kind of a mopping up operation that they actually were asked to diagram what they saw. Though Chuck did this for me for assassination science. Yeah, this is very good. And it's consistent with some of the other witnesses who were there too. And of course, on the left, a small clean puncture wound that was even being described nationwide on radio and television. And then the small clean puncture wound with a simple tracheostomy incision through it thereafter, very clean. And here you have him saying the autopsy doctor simply never entertained the notion that an exit wound had been obscured by a tracheostomy. Of course, it wasn't in fact an exit wound, it was an entrance wound. Right. And, and now, just recently, a colleague of Dr. Perry's, Perry did the tracheostomy, but a colleague of Dr. Perry's at the University of Washington tells us, and I, this is all in my review, you can look it up, that Perry actually told him that he had to lie to the Warren Commission. Yes. Yes. No, I, read, I, read, your, I read your review today, and yes. Yeah, so Perry didn't even believe what he it's told It's right him. in this quote, David. Furthermore, we now know that Malcolm Perry lied to the Warren Commission. He had seen an entrance wound, as recently reported by his colleague Donald W. Miller, Jr., MD of the University of Washington. In fact, Perry had previously told Robert Artwald, MD, the same story. And in fact, he told the Parkland Press Conference assembled, David, right there in Parkland, the day of the assassination, three different times that the bullet was coming at him that it was a wound of entry. I mean, this is embarrassingly bad. Is this Wagner so incompetent he's never even read the transcript of the Parkland press mm -hmm. conference? Well, I suppose he's read it, but he discounts it. <clears throat> yeah, but you're not, you're not at liberty to do that just willy-nilly. Well, you have, you have to do some rather strange logical tricks in order to reach the final conclusion that this was Jim, possible. Jim, Jim, if I may. Yes, sir. Yes, if I may, I would like to uh, quote from, uh, this is Life Magazine from uh, September, uh, I'm sorry, the S Saturday Evening Post of, uh, I believe, a week or two after the event. And uh, they had a spread here on Malcolm Perry. And I'm just going to, you know, briefly uh, quote this, uh, if I may. Sure. Uh, Here's the most important man in the world, Perry thought, and he's talking about the JFK. The chest was not moving and there was no apparent heartbeat inside it. The wound in the throat was small and neat. Blood was running out of it. It was running out too fast. The occipital parietal, which is a part of the back of the head, had a huge flap. The damage a rifle bullet does as it comes out of the person's body is unbelievable. Bleeding from the head wound covered the floor. There was a mediastinal wound in connection with the bullet hole in the throat. This means air and blood were being packed together in the chest. Perry called for a scalpel. He was going to start a tra tra tracheostomy, which is the opening of the throat and inserting a tube into the windpipe. The incision had to be made below the small bullet wound. So that is a uh, hands-on uh, description of what Malcolm Perry- Except the incision was made right through the bullet wound rather than below it. It was made right, right through it. Yeah, and this is from the Saturday Evening Post of, uh, uh, about uh, two weeks after the assassination. David, we have reason it's an article to by Jimmy Breslin. It's an article by Jimmy Breslin. I have it on, on, my, on my screen right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David, we have reason to suspect this is not actually even the body of JFK. But clearly, the wound has been enlarged. And Crenshaw told me that he had closed JFK's eyes when they were wrapping him in sheets and putting him in the bronze ceremonial casket. So it's odd that the eyes would be open here, but not if, in fact, this is a body other than that of JFK. We do know, that, though, that the uh, skull x-rays are those of JFK. Yes, yes, yes. But they have been altered. So, yes. yes critically you know, altered. Original yes. x-rays, and then they messed with them, yes. Yeah, in critical areas. Here we have then another of his claims. No evidence of any bullets not fired from Oswald's rifle was located in the body of Kennedy or Connolly or in the limousine. David, I mean, go for it. Say something. <laughs> well, we should introduce Dr. Michael Chesser at this moment. Uh, Dr. Chesser is a neurologist who visited the archives on multiple occasions now. 
And he saw something that no one else saw. And that's because he was deliberately looking for it. I missed it too. But in the forehead area, we're talking about the x-rays now, not the photographs. Mm -hmm. On the x-rays, he saw tiny metal fragments near the high forehead. Associated with that, he saw a presumably bullet hole in the forehead bone. This is all, of course, consistent with a shot that entered from the front and deposited those tiny metal fragments at that site. These are indeed very tiny, uh, easy to miss without using a magnifying glass. But um, it's, it, and these fragments are on the same trail as the fragments we just saw a few minutes ago. So it all fits together very, very clearly with a shot from the front. But there's other evidence too, of course. Yeah. For, Go, David. Uh, I was going to continue on that screen. Please. Uh, there, there are other, there is other evidence of bullets uh, being fired other than Oswald's that day. There's a Belmont FBI menu in a document that Joe McBride found. Uh, this is uh, something not found in the body, but the memo, the FBI mem memo describes a bullet find, found behind the ear. So what happened to that? And then Tom Robinson, one of the morticians, mm -hmm. told the uh, ARRB, that's the Assassination Records Review Board, mm -hmm. about 10 bullet fragments that had been removed from JFK's head. Those have disappeared. Then, then Dennis David, who was the, uh, the military man on call that night, typed a memo about receiving four bullet fragments, which he actually saw. And then uh, James Jenkins, who was standing next to JFK all night as the assistant to Dr. Humes, saw a transparent plastic bag containing bone and bullet fragments that was lying next to JFK's head. Where did that come from? Was that from someone else other than JFK? If so, why would they put it next to JFK's head? Well, at any rate, you can guess already that Robert Wagner does not tell us any of these things. And the names of Dennis David and James Jenkins and Tom Robinson's account are nowhere to be found in Robert's book. I would also like to add, if I may, uh, Joe O'Donnell, the photographer who also saw the uh, photograph of the uh, bullet hole that you're talking about in the front and the uh, forehead. And uh, you yourself, Dr. Mantic, uh, cite the story of Quentin Schwinn who also saw uh, uh, photos which uh, were also cited by uh, Douglas Horn uh, regarding that same hole of entrance in the, uh, in the, in the forehead. Yeah, Quentin was shown uh, what purported to be official, original autopsy photographs of JFK. And uh, a, a medical illustrator's free production of right. that appears in my ebook, uh, JFK's Head Wounds, for those right. who that's, that's the one I'm citing. That's the one I'm citing. So, David, you're telling me Wagner doesn't even talk about Thomas Evan Robinson's summary of the wounds that, that he gave, uh, you know, dur during the phone call? I mean, that's well, shocking. As I said here, Robert, Tom Robinson's report to the ARRB about the 10 bullet fragments, it's not in his book. Just stunning. And of course, we have all the evidence of the shot from the front that passed through the windshield. This is the best version of the Alchins we have. And if you look where JFK's left ear would be, if his left ear were visible, you'll see that small white spiral nebula with a dark hole in the center where the bullet passed through. Jack's already been hit. Then we have a close-up here on the left. You can see the bullet versus the substitute windshield the Secret Service would later uh, uh, display as though it had been on the limousine at the time. And as you observed, David, we have the brilliant study uh, about the windshield, uh, the Kennedy windshield from the, the murder in Dealey Plaza by Douglas Weldon, where even tracked down the official at Ford Motor Company to replace it and confirm there was a through and through bullet. You can actually see it here in frame 225. Is this supposed to be another uh, 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 round fired by Lee Oswald? No, of course, only Oswald could do these things. But if you look at the review, uh, my review at the end, I show some more close-up photographs of this. Yes, and of course we have the double hit theory which Josiah Thompson so skillfully explained in six seconds and then withdrew subsequently when he was attempting to repudiate conspiracy 
for the 50th observance. I was calling him out on it in advance, and he started to do a series of short videos for the New York Times. But after I dispatched what he had to say about Umbrella Man, they abandoned the whole project. And then we have, of course, from the Zapruder film, The Discovery, you can actually see the blowout in frame 374, 375. There's a close-up, and of course, we see the pinkish bone extension there sticking out. It's a blue-gray matter, of course. That's Yeah, this is excellent, Jim. Oh, this is a great close-up shot of it. Excellent, yeah. David. Excellent. Yeah. This is very good. And, and, then, and then you see where it's blacked out in the earlier frames, uh, but it's present here, and how closely it corresponds to Area P, as you identified as having been patched in the x-rays, where here you can see what I take to be a very close relationship between your definition in terms of the altered x-rays and what we find in frame 374. Yeah, so there were a lot of uh, government employees busy at work here. It would, it would appear. Larry, by the way, David, and this is one reason I'm especially glad you're here, discovered that Jackie's glove provides a background for defining the blowout in JFK's skull. Oh, uh, yes. You begin yes. to appreciate the enormity of it. Here you have her left hand and her right, and it's the left that's providing the background. Here you can see a nice uh, definition of where his skull ought to be, but is in fact missing. Then you have a further delineation. Here, he used a, a blender to create a 3D image, David, of the enormity of this cavity, which you can see here too. Larry, yes. Larry, please comment on your excellent work here. Well, uh, well, this we did this uh, a few years ago, and I was astounded uh, upon seeing this. This was frame 343. And it happened to be in, uh, in a video that I was watching on YouTube on the revision of history. And uh, it, it, they, they showed this so incredibly enhanced version of, of Z343. Uh, in fact, I've gone to other version of the, versions of the Z film and I've never seen you know, this good a, a rendering, a rendition of, of, um, a, of a close up, you know, and, and I went further and I did some studies, you know, I did some Photoshopping and whatever, you know, on, on uh, remember we did a show on, where we further delineated and, and ran the, the image through other filters and everything. And everything kept coming out completely positive that this was a defect, that there was just no way that this could have been an interpretation of the image. You know, the only way that this, you can interpret this is that there was a serious big defect. And in fact, I, later on, I even tried to do uh, some uh, 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 um, placing uh, portions of the, of the Harper fragment over that defect. And some of the edges happened to actually line up. So uh, that's, uh, you know. And of course, Clint Hill, who was the first to observe it up close and personal, described it as a a fist-sized blowout at the back of the head. And he yeah. was lying across Jack's body, peering into this bloody, gaping wound, gave his colleagues a thumb down. And David, you know, that that line, that description by Clint Hill, even made it into the book, The Kennedy Detail, about the Secret Service in Dallas, which, of course, all by itself blows apart the Warren Commission finding. Jim, yeah, even, Jackie, even Jackie said that she couldn't hold on to anything back there. David. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. Jackie said she, she had, she, from the front, he looked just fine, but that she had a terrible time holding his skull and brains together at the back of the head. Here's, here's another absurdity from Wagner. There is no reasonable conclusion other than that Kennedy's back wound and the throat wound were the result of the same bullet. David, gag me with a spoon. <laughs> Well, of course you're right. There, there is so much anatomic dissonance in that statement. The, the trail cannot be matched properly in either the horizontal or the vertical direction. It's totally consistent, inconsistent with the eyewitnesses. The small, actually very tiny throat wound is totally inconsistent with that. Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Most likely the back wound was caused by um, 
shrapnel from the street. And, and we know that some x-ray tests were done on JFK's clothing, and they did show a bit of metal at that strike in his coat and, and shirt. So it's probably a, a piece of metal, shrapnel from the street. So that's consistent with a shot that came from the rear that struck the street and then ricocheted up, probably the bullet fractured and a fragment of it hit JFK in the back. That's why it didn't go in very far. And we have so many witnesses who reported that when the um, pathologist tried to probe this wound, they could not uh, enter it very far. Right, it only went in about the second knuckle on your little finger. However, I have it fired from the top of the county records building by Harry Weatherford, a deputy sheriff, using a 30 6 to fire a man liquor carcano bullet using a Saboa plastic collar, which you actually mentioned in your review, David. Yes, I do. You know, that had the shallow penetration. We know quite a lot about it. Of course, the, the core of the magic bullet theory occurs by elevating this wound to the base of the back of the neck. You see here, even Gerald Posner can't really draw it properly. But here we have the location of the wound in the jacket and the location uh, of where it is. Notice a massive discrepancy here, David, between where it is in the jacket. And I know while you've been at the uh, National Archives, you had a member of the staff put on the shirt and the jacket and discern that the hole in the shirt was ever so slightly below the hole in the jacket. But look how inconsistent that hole in the jacket is with this description. And then you have the hole in the shirt, which aligns with it, as I've just described. You have the wound that Boswell described on the back at the same location. This is all about five and a half inches below the collar, just to the right of the spinal column. We have the, the O'Neill and Siebert diagram. We have the back wound lower than the front, front wound. And of course, since it was coming in a downward direction, most unlikely it could have exited at the throat wound. You have uh, Admiral Berkeley saying that there was a second wound occurring at the posterior back at about the level of the third thoracic vertebrae. So he's talking about a bullet wound there, David. And of course, that third thoracic vertebrae is, is the location we're talking about. When the Warren Commission did its reenactment, they put a big uh, 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 spot on the back of the jacket, but also on the back of the head where the Bethesda physicians claimed he'd been shot. So we have what I regard as my favorite photograph from the archives, namely Arlen Specter illustrating the trajectory the magic bullet would have had to have taken for the hypothesis to be true. And you can see because of the location of the patch well below the pointer that this photograph intended to illustrate the theory actually refutes it. Here we have how they use the Secret Service Cadillac instead of the Lincoln making the whole reconstruction forensically insignificant, no doubt on purpose. How Ford made the key change by redescribing the wound from uh, 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 up to the back of the neck from his uppermost back, which was already an exaggeration. And we have your masterful demonstration using a patient with similar chest and neck dimensions that the alleged entry at the back of the neck and exit at the front of the throat is not even anatomically possible because cervical vertebrae intervene. David, this is just a monster deception. It's unbelievable that you have someone like Wagner in this day and age perpetrating a fraud on his readers. So when you know where the bullet actually hit, about five and a half inches below the collar, you get the absurdity that has been so frequently lampooned by Cyril Wecht of this bullet moving in preposterous ways to perform all this damage. Very, very embarrassing, David. We also have uh, my discussion with John Ebersol, the radiologist. I had a good conversation with him on the telephone, and we discussed where that wound in the back was located. In other words, what level was it at? And he said it was at about the fourth thoracic vertebral body, which is even worse than anything you've yeah. said. Even lower down than Admiral Berkeley. Yes. Well, here we have uh, him diverting attention to Oswald, claiming Oswald hid in the theater until he was apprehended. There's so much wrong about this, David. You wouldn't think he could pack so much falsehood into a single sentence fragment. Well, he's quite good at that. And this whole paragraph of response 
uh, indicates all of the items that he has left out in the process of reaching his conclusion. You want to go through this? Please. So he, uh, Wagner doesn't tell us about the second person who was also captured by the police that day. Oswald, you'll recall, was let out the front of the theater. But a second person was also captured just a few minutes later, according to the witnesses here. And this individual was let out the back door of the theater in handcuffs. Where Bill Alexander was waiting for him with his gun drawn. <laughs> Amazing. And so we have at least two witnesses who confirm this. The other oddity is that Oswald, as you know, was captured in the orchestra of the theater. But the second person apparently was captured in the balcony. Mm -hmm. And according to the Dallas Police Department's official report, quote, the suspect was later arrested in the balcony of the Texas theater, end quote. And then police detective uh, Stringfellow reported to Captain Ganaway, quote, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested in the balcony of the Texas theater, end quote. So there was massive confusion, apparently, even in the police department about who was who and who was arrested where. And you mentioned Butch Burroughs here, who has testified to selling popcorn to Oswald about 110, which mm -hmm. makes it impossible for him to have shot Officer Tippett, which, of course, is another of the elaborate charades that were provided to attempt to incriminate Oswald in activities he had nothing to do with. Yes, the timing is totally wrong. And here we have, of course, the alleged location. I mean, when he's going to the theater, and it would appear to meet his contact, why would it deviate and go so far out of the way to have this encounter with Tippett? I mean, it's a total fabrication. It makes no reasonable sense. As Robert Groden has observed, the first officer on the scene found four shell casings of two different manufacturers that had been ejected from automatics, two Western and two, uh, 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 two of uh, 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 the another, which he initialed. Subsequently, of course, since Oswald only had a revolver that did not automatically eject shell casings, they made a replacement with revolver cartridges, only now they did not have any initials, and there were three of one manufacturer and one of the other I mean, it's embarrassingly bad how they sought to frame him. Well, that's all true. And uh, Robert still believes that Oswald was on the scene there shooting Tibbet. Groden, you mean? I'm sorry, uh, Robert Wagner. Wagner, Wagner. Right, Robert, Robert Wagner. Wagner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, here, here it would seem we'd have the whole line of argument that would defeat Wagner outright with his uh, fantasy. With a, with a man in the doorway. Here's the classic photograph from Robert Groden, where we know, of course, Billy Lovelady went to, at the request of the FBI on the 29th of February, 1964, wearing the shirt he'd worn on that occasion, which was a red and white vertically striped short sleeve shirt bearing no relationship whatsoever to the long sleeve richly textured shirt on the man in the doorway. They even stated right in their report to J. Edgar, that he was wearing a red and white vertically striped shirt at the time uh, the motorcade passed by. Here we have a result of Larry's finding suitable photographs to determine whether the facial features as well as the height, the weight, the build, the shirt, and the t-shirt fit Oswald. Here you can see Lee on the left and Billy on the right. And when you impose Lee over the features of the man in the doorway, it's an exact fit, hand in glove. And yet, when you contrast it with Billy, Lee on the left, Billy on the right, the ear's too low, the jaw's wrong, the nose is wrong. I mean, it's really outrageous, but Larry has also confirmed that the man standing beside Lee in the doorway with his hands raised to protect his eyes from the sun was indeed Billy Lovelady who himself said he thought it was odd they'd be confused because he was two to three inches shorter, 15 to 20, probably considerably more heavier. I mean, it's embarrassingly bad. So David, I don't know. This is a, a, a Richard Hook's reconstruction of how they fit the pieces together to make it come out as we find in the present version of the Alchons. 
but where Larry has used Blender to do a reconstruction to show us what it ought to have looked like had it been in color and had it been preserved for posterity. Larry, I just love your work here. Why don't you uh, elaborate a bit for David about it? Yes, I have not seen this before. Well, the, the Blender uh, aspect, uh, which is in my book, and it's, uh, I believe, groundbreaking in the sense that nobody has ever used a three-dimensional program, you know, like Blender, to reconstruct Dealey Plaza the way it was on September, the, um, November 22nd, 1963, by using Robert Cutler's original maps Architect uh, Robert Cutler was a, a first-generation researcher, and he uh, disseminated a, a map, a, an architect's rendering of Dealey Plaza, and based on that, using, as, uh, using it as a reference image and the Alton 6 as a reference image and the Pruder Frame Z255, which uh, are related to each other because they are the same event taken from different perspectives, okay? so. What we did by using these reference images, it, uh, what we did is we created a, a rendering of Dili Plaza in three dimensions, and this is the result. Once you get, uh, once you start to work with the uh, objects, we call these objects in 3D, and you position them in the in where they ought to be in relation to the reference image. Then you start to get a, a three dimensional rendering of the entire scene. And uh, basically, uh, it, it allows you to study the scene in, in its pristine state before, you know, all the changes in the plaza were made over the years. And we all know, for example, the lampposts were moved over into the, uh, into the grassy area when they originally were right there. As you can see right here in the uh, Alton 6 photograph, they're right there at the curb. Okay, and a lot of other different uh, uh, changes that have been made at Dili Plaza in order to uh, dissuade or prevent researchers from actually recreating and, and uh, reestablishing, you know, how uh, Dili Plaza was and, and basically the different photographs and everything so that you can go and, and, uh, and reenact those. And uh, I think that's where Blender comes in. It's such an incredibly useful tool and I also wanted to maybe if we have a chance also uh, look how we have applied it to the Harper fragment. Yes, yes, yes. I just wanted to come back to this great version of the Alton's to identify that area in the background in the doorway where Lee was standing when the motorcade passed by. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, the ultimate refutation of Wagner is Lee was in the doorway and therefore not only could not have been the lone demented gunman, he cannot have been one of the shooters. But David, I'm sure he'd just dismiss it because his mind's made up. He doesn't want to be bothered with facts. No, he, he doesn't address that issue at all. No, and this is, and this is scientifically proven, Jim, the, the way that uh, we have presented this, you know, with forensic overlays, which yes. are accepted uh, uh, procedures which are done uh, in everyday uh, forensic criminal investigations. And, uh, you know, it's, in fact, uh, the images are so superior in, in, in the sense where they, as you, say, as, you, as you mentioned, they fit hand in glove, you know, with the image, you know, the facial uh, structure of Lee Oswald versus uh, the other uh, individual, uh, Billy Lovelady. And, uh, you know, I, 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 like I have said when, since we did this in 2015, uh, I would love to for somebody to come out and and refute this and do yeah. the same, do the same procedure scientific procedure that we have done uh, right. scientific protocol and nobody has come forth so you know what can I say David I don't know how familiar you are with this region but it's been subjected to a lot of alteration notice the man in the doorway his left shoulder is missing because. Yes. The yes. figure behind him, known as Black Tie Man, is both in front of him and behind him at the same time, which, of course, is an impossibility. Notice as you move to the right, there's a face that's been completely obfuscated. It turns out that the man with his hands up, we call him Black Hole Man because his face has been blocked out, who turns out to be <laughs> Billy Lovelady, had his shirt obfuscated because it would have stood out because it was a red and white vertically striped shirt. And I cannot believe, but even after pointing out all these anomalies that are obvious indications of alteration, there are some within the community who just 
insist that there's no evidence of alteration here, David. I just am dumbfounded. This is indeed a very odd looking photograph, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, the, the infinitesimal... David, I, pub I published at least 10 articles about this, all right, and the identification yes. of the man in the door. Uh, Ralph Sinke was completely brilliant to notice that really the key in identifying was the height, the weight, the build, the shirt, and the T-shirt, rather than the facial features, because they were so significantly different than those of Billy Lovelady that it could only be Lee Oswald. But then Larry adds the frosting on the cake by showing that even the facial features are those of Lee Oswald and not those of Billy Lovelady. So I, I don't know how we could have a more conclusive identification of the man in the doorway as having been Lee Oswald, who therefore had to be the, the consummate patsy, couldn't possibly have performed the roles that were attributed to him. Frankly, it's, it's embarrassing that there are any in the community who want to deny the force of this research. John, I just want to, if you can back up right there, we have uh, both of them side by side. And, and the, the key here is observing the shadow below the noses of both of these individuals, because obviously the eyebrows, the nose and everything, you know, they're completely, um, they, they are not the same. Okay, when you, the overlays fit Lee more than uh, Billy. But uh, the clinching deal here is the shadow below the nose. If you, if you look at the shadow below Lee Oswald, it fits perfectly. You know, the way it, is, it projects, you know, in the noon, uh, 12.30 uh, p.m. at the time, you know, the sun. Uh, and, and if you look how to, uh, to the right, the figure on the right, Billy Lovelady, it, this shadow is completely disassociated from the nose. Yeah, it's miscast. It's Completely. falling in the wrong location. Exactly, exactly. So that in itself, but then if you go forward uh, towards the back and you look at the ear, you look at the eyebrows, you look at the chin, you look at the position of the lips and everything, and, and I, have, I have mentioned this many, many times, the key to looking at the overlays is the, the, the less amount of movement uh, that you see between one and the other means that you have a positive match. If you see a lot of movement on the other uh, 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 on the other uh, rendering, uh, then obviously it is not a match, and uh, that's you know that's the way it works. David, they knew that Larry was going to present this proof that Lee was in the doorway at the right. mock trial in Houston, so they had to find a ground to exclude him. It was a real stretch, and it was an insult that he was left out because his proof is conclusive, conclusive. It's just stunning to me how much subterfuge continues to this very day to keep the best evidence out of the public arena. Dim, and this one in particular that you're showing, uh, as you can see, uh, the issue that you were talking about earlier about the, uh, the shoulder, you know, missing the, the being both in front and behind. If you can uh, uh, go back one slide here. If you zoom in here, obviously you can't, but you can see that it's impossible. The man is either in front or behind him. You know, you cannot have that right. anomaly that you see in the Alton 6 photograph, where you see both in front and behind, you know, and the shoulder, you know, the area there of, of the left shoulder of doorman uh, here, when you position the models in the, correct, uh, in the correct position, it's just impossible. It just doesn't work that way in real life. Yes, yes. Well, I think your work with Blender is sensational. David, I particularly wanted to draw you out about your conclusions. Although Wagner relies heavily on many of the following evidence items, they should never be admitted into the courtroom. Their provenance is highly questionable or else they are outright corrupt. The autopsy photos, the autopsy x-rays, the Oswald items, including the weapon and the magic bullet, palm print on the man in the Carcano, the Zapruder film. But David, I think they're important to admit as evidence of falsification uh, uh, in order to frame Oswald, which can only have been done by those in the position to do that, who of course were the governmental authorities in control of the scene, uh, where we know the x-rays were altered, uh, uh, where Ebersol appears to have played a key role there at Bethesda. We know the throat was altered at Bethesda. We know autopsy photographs were changed and the body actually altered. We know the palm prints were added after the man was already dead. 
So I'm sure you would agree that this is all important evidence, not as direct evidence, but as indirect evidence, because it shows the efforts to which the government went to frame a man who is innocent of the crime. Yeah, so you can use these items to show just the exact opposite of what they purport to show, namely that your taxpayer dollars were hard at work. Yes, 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 yes. Except for a couple of innocent uh, FBI agents, Cybert and O'Neill, who reported that they had seen, you know, uh, uh, a surgery, you know, to the, uh, to the head area, you know, and maybe, who knows, we've never known about this. And David, I know you have some discussion with Wagner here about these photographs from the HSCA, where you can see the, the, what, where they move the entry wound four inches to the crown of the head. You can see it in the drawing on the right, but not in the photograph on the left, which suggests, of course, it was a complete fabrication, not to mention that we're not witnessing the fist-sized blood at the back of the head here. And of course, the pathologist did not recognize that painted in wound that is circled in the image you're showing here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, they did not recognize that. They did not know what that was. And they, right. insisted, they insisted the actual bullet entry was at least four inches lower. And here, of course, we see that skull flap that's pink in, the, in frame 374, just for the sake of those who may not appreciate what we're witnessing here. And then, David, of course, you've done so much brilliant work on the Harper fragment in placing it properly. Uh, I know that Wagner, once again, just doesn't know what he's talking about. Literally, the man, the man is either an ignoramus or de deliberately feigning ignorance because he ignores such a vast quantity of evidence that leads to conclusions precisely the opposite of those he's maintaining. He doesn't even cite the three pathologists at Methodist Hospital in Dallas, mm -hmm. who said that this Harper fragment came from the occipital area, that's the back of the head. He doesn't even cite them. Their names do not appear in his book. Even Billy Harper's uncle. Yeah, his uncle doesn't appear in the book, and the two other pathologists who agreed with him do yeah. not appear well, been, in the book. Had it not been for uh, Billy Harper's uncle, I believe his name was Jack, we wouldn't even uh, know that it existed because they took pictures of it uh, right away that day. That's right. That's right. Jack Harper identified right here. And of course, David, we have this bizarre anomaly that you see what the wound as it was described at Parkland. Then, as David Lifton has emphasized, when you study the, the autopsy report from Bethesda, it's been enormously enlarged. And then, lo and behold, when it comes to the HSC reinvestigation, it's suddenly contracted and you have a tiny hole at the top of the head. Isn't this about as damning as it could be in terms of a display of the absurdity of the medical evidence in JFK and how it's been subjected to manipulation? Well, Robert Wagner would answer you, no, it's not surprising at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the explanation would be, this was in the hurly-burly, everyone was so busy and it was a president, so they lost, they couldn't even describe what they were seeing, even though these were experienced men at Parkland dealing with gunshot victims where Dallas may have been the homicide capital of the universe. Of course, at the mock trial, uh, Robert Wagner and I and the others in the audience viewed this documentary called The Parkland Doctors, in which we had, as I recall, six or seven who were there that day and who were still totally mystified by the back of the head photographs. And you have one um, reconstruction here for the HSCA. They, they could not understand how that could be consistent with the sketches on the left here because that's what they remember. Yes. So yes. Robert, Wagner, Robert Wagner was there that day watching, uh, watching all these doctors uh, say this and agree that they couldn't explain this, but Robert can explain it. David, is Wagner even aware of the immensity of the wound as it's described in mathematical precision in the autopsy report from Bethesda as opposed to the Parkland doctor's description? Yeah, the, the actual wound involved not just the occipital area, but also the parietal area mm -hmm. and the temporal area. And that's clearly spelled out in the autopsy report. I don't remember for sure if, if Robert is fully aware of how how extensive that wound was. More, more like the middle image that you're showing here now. Say that again, David. You're saying 
that the Parkland observation was closer to the center description than the left? Yes, because the part of the wound was covered by the scalp. And the, the pathologists in their official autopsy report also indicated that the wound involved not just the occipital area, but the parietal area and the temporal but, area to some But extent. if we go all the way back to your area P, it would seem to me area P corresponded very closely with the blood as we see it in frame 374, not so much like Bethesda, more like the one on the left rather than the middle. Well, what the doctors in Dallas saw was the wound at, on the left. But the, the full extent of the wound wasn't immediately apparent. But the x-rays show that it extended much farther than just that area that you're showing here on the far left. And here you had some quotes with which you actually began your article. Rather fascinating, and in particular, you emphasize Clarence Darrow's quote, there is no such thing as justice in or out of court. Would you like to expand <laughs> upon that? Well, Clarence Darrow, of course, was involved in the Scopes monkey trial in Kentucky in the 1920s, as I recall. And of course, he was, he was defending the high school teacher who was teaching evolution. Yes, yes. And, and, and Darrow actually lost the case. Uh, and his client was fined, but it was a token amount. And so in effect, Darrow did win. The reason I, I inserted these quotes though is important because what Robert Wagner wants us to do uh, is to use the courtroom as the means of resolving all these issues. And so in the first few pages of my review, I take him to task and show what an awful model that would be for arriving at truth. And uh, these quotes also from, from lawyers bear this out totally. Yes, already in Assassination Science, I had an essay about the meaning of the word proof in three different contexts in pure mathematics and logic in science and in the courtroom. Larry, I know you'd like to take opportunity to discuss a bit about the Harper Fragment. You're yes. welcome to do a share screen. Sure, 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 sure. Let's, uh, let's do that. Uh, first of all, uh, we have this uh, blog post that I did, I, wow, it looks like so long ago, uh, in uh, February of 2017. And, and basically, uh, what this is what we start with, you know, our reference images and our reference image, which I spoke about before. And if you look flat, okay, and Dr. Mantic obviously knows that this is not a flat artifact. This is, a, this has curvature. And as we, uh, and we, we know how big it was, you know, from uh, the size of, of the Harper fragment from the literature that we have 2.73 by 2.13 inches. And uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Mantic has seen a better rendering of the fragment uh, than this one. This is taken from CD Commission document 1269. And we have the outer on the left and the inner on the right. And you have the foramen uh, uh, structures and everything. And on the outside, uh, the, uh, the way it, it is. And, and like I said, it's not, you cannot tell the curvature. And, and another thing, the beveling of the inner and outer portions of the fragment are not readily appreciated, you know, and when you have it separated the way it is here. And so basically what we do is we use these uh, reference images and we create a mesh, okay? And within that mesh, we are able to start working, you know, on the fragment, you know, as a 3D structure, okay? And if, and I'm, I'm gonna just uh, stop my, uh, my share here uh, real quick because I want to I want to go into uh, blender real, real fast here if I may go ahead uh, yeah uh, I don't know uh, can you see this can you see this here now yes yes okay, okay. so uh, I'm in blender right now okay and what we do here as you can see I'm able to work with uh, the uh, Harper fragment in three dimensions okay and and, and I can zoom in, I have different uh, uh, modes here. I have the object mode, okay, I have, uh, I have uh, here in edit mode, and uh, not in edit mode, but in, in uh, wireframe mode, okay. Once we have the actual uh, uh, framework of, of, the, of the Harper fragment, and as you can see, you can tell that it has curvature, okay. And I took this, uh, actually, and, and this is why I really wanted to get Dr. Mantic's opinion on this, 
because, uh, it, you know, the skull and the occ occipital parietal area, you know, has this degree of curvature that you need to take into consideration in the Harper fragment, okay? And when we start to, what we do is we, uh, we texture, we use the same texture of the uh, Harper fragment of the photograph and we place it onto the mesh, okay? And this is what, I, this is what you're seeing right now, okay? And once we have this, now we can work with this and we can, you know, tell, we can actually uh, see, you know, what the, this type of bone really looked like. Now, the one issue that I have faced, I've been faced with has been the actual uh, uh, thickness of, uh, of the structure, okay? I have looked into, on the internet, you know, to uh, get, you know, the actual thickness of this bone, and I don't know, this is what, uh, well, you I'm know, sure David can tell you. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, point, uh, one, I don't know, uh, point zero one two, or, uh, you know, what the, the thickness of this bone would be, uh, anatomically speaking. And, uh, so, and, and in order to make this mesh to be as accurate as possible. Okay. So, uh, basically, <laughs> you know, uh, this is, again, you have the inner and the outer. And once you place these, you know, in the proper perspective, okay. And what I'm going to do here. Uh, I'm going to, wait a minute, let me run this here down, uh, because I want to get this, hold on, uh, just bear with me here, let me run this up, and I'm going to run this across, okay, now I have the entire, uh, structure here on the screen in object mode, okay, this is without the, the texturing, and as you can see, um, I have different, uh, light sources here, these are all light sources that I'm going to use uh, to render the image later on, okay? But in, when I'm working with it, I notice the beveling, you know, between the inner and the outer, specifically here in this portion right here. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, zooming in. Uh, you see this here right here? Uh, when, you know, this is very, very noticeable. All right, and, uh, and and I thought this was really really cool, you know, when because uh, and and this is only observable when you render this in three D. When you look at it in two D, you know, it's there, you know, whatever, you know. But you know, it really uh, uh, jumps out at you when you uh, work on this. And I'm gonna just go into here. Uh, I'm gonna select the uh, object, and I'm gonna go. This is what the mesh actually looks like. Okay. Larry, with a 3D printer, you could print out a Harper yes. fragment, could you That's not? That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and, and in order to, to study it, and this is the way that it was structured, okay, if I go into, uh, you know, uh, I can actually go in here and, and alter, you know, the structure of the uh, fragment of, of, the, of the mesh, of course. And um, then what we do is we go into uh, our object and, and we go over here and uh, we go into our node editor and this is what we use to texture, actually texture the fragment. We go in here and we look at, uh, uh, I have different uh, uh, textures here lined up. For example, I can go here and, and I can apply whatever texture I want. And, and in this David, case, David, don't you love this? Don't you just love this? Yes, it's uh, very visual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, basically, uh, we're applying technology, uh, that, you know, in the day and age that we're living in, you know, to uh, show, you know, what the, the deception, the actual deception that was perpetrated uh, uh, on the uh, on the American public, you know, with the uh, with the Harper fragment, you know. So, going back to uh, uh, my uh, post here, you guys can see this. Um, once we start to render you know, our images, you know, because the, the, uh, the Blender Pro picture and you can uh, increase, you know, the, the uh, resolution and, and actually, you know, like this, you know, you can see now you start to appreciate and, and, and within the uh, node editor, editor that I was showing you, you can start to actually raise values so you can see the actual, uh, you know, the bone isn't flat. The bone has little uh, uh, what do you call uh, perforations or paramina or whatever, you know, which actually raise those values. And in Blender, you can go ahead 
and do that, okay? And, and then when I, when I uh, follow David's book, you know, and insert it, this is not an actual, this is a skull that I found, you know, in Blender. Somebody um, posted this, you know, on one of the websites. It's not an exact uh, uh, replica or whatever. I'm just using, as a, using it as a reference. And this is where David places it in his book, you know. And finally, uh, when we do a little uh, uh, animation, okay, this is what we come up with, okay? So that's... Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> Brilliant. You got, I wish we got could to do a 3D printout and send it to David. Yeah, yeah I, I wish we could show this to Dr. Harper and his colleagues. That would be very yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah, and and again, again, the the uh, the amount of curvature I have estimated and the thickness of the bone, which obviously not being uh, the pro the professional, you know, that David is, you know, and uh, and I'm just going, you know, by general information that I found on the internet. Okay, but but the actual curvature is taken from using a 3D version of a skull and placing it, placing the fragment on the skull and then bending it, okay, to fit the curvature, okay? And uh, that's what Blender can do for us. That's brilliant, Larry. Can you end your screen share? Yeah, got it. Thanks, Larry. David, I just want to make one point here at the end about the contrast between the three, three views of the back of the head wound. Remember, Thomas Evan Robinson emphasized that, that James Humes took a cranial saw to the skull of JFK to enlarge in the wound. So I think we don't want to so much suggest that the actual wound was more like the center than it was like the left. I'm convinced it was more like the left than it was like the center and that the center emerged after Humes had applied the cranial saw to greatly enlarge the wound to make it look more like the effect of a shot that could have been fired from behind. Yeah, that question is always lurking in the background. Uh, the questions can be restated. When were these x-rays taken? Were they taken immediately before any manipulation was done or somewhere along the line? And so that, that's fair enough. That's the question you raise. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight, David. This has been sensational. I particularly wanted to have you and, and Larry have the opportunity to discuss some of these issues because I believe you have a great deal to contribute to one another's research. Uh, on behalf of the new JFK show, therefore, let me thank uh, Dr. David W. Manick, the world's leading expert on the medical evidence in the assassination of JFK, Larry Rivera, for being here we miss Gary King and Don Fox. This concludes the new JFK show number 210. Thank you. Jim, Jim one more comment, if I may. You may. Okay. I, I want to send out some kudos to my webmaster in the UK, Bernard Wiles. He runs my website, which your, your audience may be interested in visiting. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. It, it's simply called The Mantic View. The Mantic View. So that's all you need to type in. Excellent. I started to download. I started to download some of those excellent articles. They go back uh, quite a bit. I also wanted to make the observation that going back to the Wagner thing, you know, you sort of like get sucked in, you know, like if it was with McAdams, you know, once you start interchanging, exchanging uh, 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 articles with him, he's going to draw you into that quagmire, you know. And <laughs> I thought, I couldn't help but noticing that that's exactly what he, you know, his modus operandi is. David, you're very patient and meticulous to devote so much time to a man who, frankly, was not deserving of that time and effort, but you did it out of a sense of professional obligation and to set the record straight. Yeah, it took a lot of patience. Definitely took a lot of patience, Jim. <laughs> Thank you both. Yeah, okay. super, David, having you here. Thanks, Larry. That concludes the new JFK show number 210.